This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu Yuat. It's Thursday, May 30th. This is Africa 54. United Nations peacekeepers step up security patrols in the Central African Republic. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed discusses his country's role in fostering regional peace and security. And will examine the impact of smoking and efforts to control tobacco use in Africa. We begin tonight in the Central African Republic where Tanzanian United Nations peacekeepers are on patrol in one of the nation's most dangerous areas. The country has been rocked by violence since 2013 when mainly Muslim Seleka rebels ousted former President Francois Bozize, prompting reprisals from mostly Christian militia. The Tanzanian troops are part of the UN peacekeeping mission that's seeking to protect civilians and establish order in parts of CAR. Armed groups remain in the region near the border with Cameroon, attracted by the presence of gold and diamonds. Those armed men often set fire to villages, forcing residents to flee. They also destroy bridges to curb the intervention of peacekeepers. To help support the troops, their mission, and the region, the United Nations is financing the construction of concrete bridges. Since our patrol are moving daily from Gambia to Dilapoko, the security situation is calm but unpredictable because formerly this Liverpool was the place where there was a lot of armed group named Sirili and currently there are three era and the three. Before the bridge was a wooden structure, the road was impassable. But now we built a bridge made of concrete. Now even trucks can drive over the bridge. This area from Gambla to Dilapoko is covered by uh, thick forest and there is a lot of bridges of which they are made of timber and uh, our troops here are working with using APCs of heavy weight, huge one. That's why we need uh, concrete bridges with cement so that we can move smoothly from Gambula towards Dilapoko and Dilapoko towards Nuf. Thanks to the new bridge, the Minusco camp is not too far and the community feels more secure. If anything happens, the local leaders can easily ask for reinforcement. The bridge is of huge importance to us. The bridges allow military and UN vehicles to pass through waterways quickly and safely reach communities. Thousands of people have died because of the unrest in the diamond and gold producing country. Nearly one million of the 4.5 million population in CAR have fled their homes. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed says ongoing political and economic reforms open new opportunities for cooperation with neighboring Eritrea. In Addis Ababa, the Prime Minister spoke with VOA's Eskinda Pirel, who asked him about Ethiopia's role in greater regional collaboration on peace and security. <laughs> If we take the problem between Somalia and Kenya, we want Eritrea and South Sudan, along with Ethiopia, to help each other and provide support to solve these issues. We know that any problem between Somalia and Kenya can spill over towards us. Because of this, we would like to work together to solve it. There is a wide-ranging issue as it relates to South Sudan. We don't think that Ethiopia alone can solve the problem, and the same when it comes to the problem between us and Eritrea. And there are also problems between Eritrea and other countries too. So this is a region that has a lot of problems. But additionally, this is also a region that wants to move in the direction of integration. One of the Prime Minister's biggest accomplishments in his first year is an agreement formally ending hostilities between Ethiopia and Eritrea. He says the celebrations that followed included throwing open the country's borders. When the peace process started between the two sides, we saw the borders were widely opened in both sides of the borders. 
we can say that people were moving to and from not like foreign countries, but movement similar to what happens within a country. There weren't strict control, and many people came from there to here and from here to there. But that was not the only thing. Ethiopian opposition members who were best in Eritrea returned to Ethiopia, and Eritrean opposition members best in Ethiopia returned to Eritrea. Prime Minister Ahmed says some of those borders are now closed so the two countries can better regularize how to monitor that traffic. There needs to be a system where there is control and custom check system and need that capacity so that it would be possible to know what people are bringing in and out. There is a concern that if we leave the borders open uncontrolled that it would be difficult to prevent problems. We want to ensure that if people are coming from Ethiopia to Eritrea or from Eritrea to Ethiopia, it has to be for peace, development and tourism. That was Ethiopian Prime Minister Abe Ahmed speaking in Addis Ababa with VOA's Eskinda Firel. In neighboring Sudan, the coalition representing Sudanese protesters and opposition groups known as Forces for the Declaration of Freedom and Change claims its two-day strike, which ended on Wednesday, was a success. The group is now threatening to call for civil disobedience to pressure the military leadership to hand over power to a civilian government. The coalition is also criticizing security forces for intimidating the strikers by firing warning shots. A female street vendor was killed by gunfire late on Wednesday. But as talks over the governing body remain deadlocked, a top Sudanese army general, Mohamed Habdan Dagalo, better known as Hemeti, is also criticizing the demonstrators, whom he accuses of crippling basic services like hospital and electricity services. Hemeti serves as deputy head of the Transitional Military Council. The U.S. Embassy in Harare on Wednesday issued a statement urging the Zimbabwean government to uphold the rule of law. Parts of a Twitter post on the embassy's website said the harassment and targeted arrests of civil society leaders damages Zimbabwe's reputation and economic future. A Zimbabwean newspaper, the Zimbabwe Mail, reports that there has been an unusually heavy police presence in Harare's central business district since Tuesday as the government prepares for possible mass protests over the country's deteriorating economic situation. Members of the opposition party Movement for Democratic Change are also threatening demonstrations to force President Emerson Nangagwa out of office, saying he has failed to run the country. Now here to discuss the situation in Zimbabwe is VOA's Zimbabwe service reporter, Blessing Zulu. Blessing, it's always a great pleasure to have you on Africa 54. Thank you so much. Now, Harare is seemingly awash with rumors about a coup likely, you know, to happen any time. What more do you know about these rumors? Uh, of course, uh, the reason why former President Robert Mugabe was toppled by uh, President Emerson Mnangagwa uh, was that he was uh, failing to resuscitate the economy. Uh, but uh, apparently, um, President Mnangagwa seems to be struggling uh, also uh, to revive the economy. Inflation is uh, topping 75%, and uh, this has uh, forced uh, the prices of goods to skyrocket, uh, sometimes two times in a day. So we can safely say uh, Zimbabwe is um, uh, in a hyper-inflationary uh, environment, and uh, this is causing a lot of uh, tensions. So political temperatures are rising and uh, the government is claiming uh, that uh, there is a plot to oust uh, President Emerson Mnangagwa, hence the heavy police uh, presence. Well, wow. and what about the opposition threat to force early elections in the country? Is this even feasible? Uh, of course, I think the opposition is also taking advantage of the uh, collapsing economy uh, on um, uh, Sunday. Uh, the main opposition leader, Nelson uh, Chamisa, uh, uh, was uh, re-elected as the uh, opposition party's uh, president. And, and uh, that's when he announced uh, that uh, they want to force elections uh, before 2023, when elections are scheduled, uh, because the situation in Zimbabwe is now unattainable. But has the government reacted to the tweet from the, the U.S. Embassy in Harare? Uh, the government has not uh, reacted directly to the U.S., but it is saying that uh, it is evidence that there are people who are uh, plotting to demonstrate, 
and uh, they've uh, reacted by arresting uh, seven human rights activists and uh, an opposition uh, member of uh, parliament. And uh, some of the activists who were, who were arrested last week, five of them appeared in court today, uh, but uh, the bail hearing has been postponed to Friday. Right. Thank you so much. Blessings for Thank your insight you. into this. Uh, that's uh, VOA's Zimbabwe reporter, Blessing Zulu. Now, the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo is wreaking havoc on its most vulnerable citizens. The World Health Organization says ongoing epidemic is the second largest on record and it's inflicting a heavy toll on children. More than 25% of the confirmed and probable cases identified by early April were children under 15, compared to 18% in the last major outbreak in West Africa in 2013-2016. The WHO says more than two of every three children infected in this outbreak have died compared with just over half of the adults. As of May 26, the death toll stood at just over 1,200 people, including at least 541 who were under 18. At the Ebola Treatment Center in Beni, five members of the same family were being treated for Ebola in the late March, and three of them were children. Now, some Muslim women in Africa have an especially hard time during Ramadan because, like their male counterparts, they are fasting all day. But unlike men, when it's time to break the fast, women are often the ones expected to prepare the meal. Huba Abdi reports from Nairobi on how they balance the obligations of family and religion. For Butuli Omar, Ramadan means twice as much time in the kitchen, preparing the specially tired meals for family to break their fast, all while trying to observe the Salat prayers of Islam's holiest month herself. <laughs> When you go to pray, the time to prepare food gets late. And since everybody depends on me, I find myself praying in a hurry. Since you cannot do your prayers diligently, it's a big challenge for us. It's a month of prayers and worship, but for many women, it's very difficult to perform the duties of Salah. This is due to many commitments such as cooking, washing and even doing some calls at home. Omar says women find it especially difficult to meet their religious obligations with so much going on when the day's fasting ends. When a call to prayer signals time to break the fast, in Islam you're supposed to say some prayers during breaking the fast. But for women at that time you are now serving the food for the men so that they can find everything is set and sometimes women have no time to pray. Omar says it's even harder to find time for prayer when you have small children. As you can see, when the baby sets her eyes on me, I have to carry her because she refuses to play outside. Mama Malassin Juma says preparing the iftar dinner is a lifelong obligation for Muslim women, no matter their age. I'm very old now and suffer from diabetes and high blood pressure. But I also have to do this job as I believe God will give me patience since I am fasting and praying. After the iftar dinner is served, Omar and Juma says women still have no time to relax as they must clean up from that meal and get back to the kitchen to cook for the early morning suhoor. Hoba Abdi, VOA News, Nairobi. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, efforts to control tobacco use on the continent. Stay with us. Voices. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about. Sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world, and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower, and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. And Hadiza Kiari. And Ayan Bior. And Orion Itangi Shaka. It's time for Our Voices. Could be French, English, 
Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic, it is the beat. The African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. I am Sheka Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent um, to most know, people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. The number of traditional church weddings in Britain has dropped by 25% in the last decade. Increasingly, millennial and Generation Z couples are opting for more relaxed locations. Since 1994, when the law changed to allow venues like hotels and stately homes to host marriages, more and more people are opting for social-style ceremonies rather than walking up the aisle. In 2016, just 25 percent of all marriages in the UK were part of a religious ceremony, according to the Office for National Statistics. Two decades before that, there were twice as many church weddings. The Church of England is stepping up efforts to lure couples back, including advertising in bridal magazines. If couples want to serve beer at their wedding, the options are growing. Craft beer brewers are constantly coming up with new recipes with unique ingredients to stand out from the crowd and grab a share of the $30 billion craft beer market in the United States. From breakfast beers to dessert beers, many new brews are innovative, others are odd, and some sound kind of disgusting. From macaroni and cheese ale to a steak and onion kolsch, beer made with sushi, and for the truly adventurous, a stout made with grilled buffalo testicles. And finally, Ferrari has unveiled a luxury car with a difference, a hybrid model that can cruise silently through city streets on electric power, as well as hitting a top speed of 340 kilometers per hour. The new car permits 25 kilometers of electric only power allowing drivers to pass through city centers free of noise or dirty emissions. Its price will be announced this week. Ferrari said last year it planned on 15 new models, including hybrids, a utility vehicle, and special editions. And that's what's trending today. U.S. Special Counsel Robert Mueller Wednesday declined to clear U.S. President Donald Trump of obstructing justice though the president responded by declaring himself innocent and that court case is closed. In his first public comments on the Russia probe, Mueller said because of a long-standing Department of Justice policy, the president cannot be charged with a federal crime while in office, and, that, and he indicated it's up to Congress to take any further action. Here is VOA White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara. This was the first time Robert Mueller spoke publicly since he was appointed to investigate Russian interference in the 2016 U.S. election and potential collusion by the Trump campaign. If we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. Mueller repeated his report's conclusion that Russia did meddle in the U.S. election and there was insufficient evidence to charge the Trump campaign of conspiring with Moscow. But did Trump obstruct justice during the investigation? Mueller left the question open, explaining that under U.S. Justice Department policy, a president cannot be charged with a federal crime while in office, leaving the issue to Congress. The Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a sitting president of wrongdoing. Moments after Mueller spoke, President Donald Trump tweeted his response, claiming innocence due to insufficient evidence. We agree with him. There was no collusion. There was no conspiracy. And we consider this case closed. Congressional Democrats responded swiftly on Mueller's statement. As Mueller again highlighted this morning, it falls to Congress to respond to the crimes 
lies and other wrongdoing of President Trump. We will do so. While Nadler said the president is not above the law, it's still unclear whether Democrats will begin impeachment anytime soon. Many have been reluctant because any action could benefit the president politically. Trump is thrilled about an impeachment trial because all it's going to do is probably kick off a rally around the flag effect and cause people to support the president. Amid the partisan debate on impeachment, the issue of Russian meddling in the 2016 U.S. election often gets sidelined, something that Mueller tried to refocus on. He really repeated that that was the main concern of the report, and I think he thinks that the rest of it, the obstruction, it's a little bit gray in areas, and of course it's going to become a partisan issue. And while there's not much that can be done about the partisan divide, Belt added that there are steps that can and need to be taken to ensure that the 2020 election is secure. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News at the White House. It's time for our health report and joining us now is Africa 54 health correspondent Lino Mudu with the latest news on the harmful effects of tobacco. Lino? And that's right, Esther. The World Health Organization says tobacco kills 8 million people each year and it also says e-cigarettes are not a proven alternative. Cigarette smoking is often a hard habit to break. According to the World Health Organization, there are around 1.1 billion smokers worldwide. But health experts say cigarette smoking harms nearly every organ of the body. Dr. Vinayak Prasad is director of the WHO, Department for the Prevention of Non-Communicable Diseases. So every year we know about 8 million people die from tobacco. That's the, the global figure, about 8 million. About 1 million of them die from secondhand smoke. Now, these figures have stayed constant for the last couple of years. Dr. Prasad says 40% of tobacco victims die from lung diseases, including cancers and chronic respiratory diseases, about 1 million from secondhand smoke. Children are also affected significantly. More than 60,000 children around the world under age 5 die of lower respiratory infections caused by secondhand smoke. Dr. Prasad says e-cigarettes also pose a serious concern, dispelling the belief that they are less harmful. So these products are not smokeless. These the products are tobacco products. So there are, there are two, two big things. One is these are tobacco products, and our recommendation as WHO is please regulate them as tobacco products. The claims that these are less harmful, we don't know. Dr. Prasad warns that e-cigarettes appear to normalize smoking and hooks young people. On the contrary, we are seeing that in countries that have been very liberal with electronic cigarettes, they, the use of ends is very common amongst youth, actually more than two times what uh, conventional cigarettes is. So basically there's a perception that these are safe products and it's actually hitting the market um, and the, the group which is most vulnerable. Uh, children, teenage children. So it's a, it's a problem which I, we are seeing uh, in a number of countries now. The WHO recommends that e-cigarettes be subjected to the same guidelines as for tobacco products. Non-smokers should be protected from secondhand smoke, pregnant women should be prohibited from using them, and advertising content must be regulated. Observers say anti-tobacco campaigns and measures are bearing fruit but mostly in high-income countries. On the other hand, the smoking population remains constant or even increases in low-income countries where the tobacco industry is now focusing its sales efforts. And World No Tobacco Day is observed each year on May 31st to encourage abstinence from all forms of tobacco consumption. The focus of this year's No Tobacco Day 2019 is on tobacco and lung health. The campaign aims to increase awareness on the negative impact that tobacco has on people's lung health, from cancer to chronic respiratory disease, and the fundamental role lungs play for the health and well-being of all people. The campaign also serves as a call to action, advocating for effective policies to reduce tobacco consumption and to engage stakeholders across multiple sectors in the fight for tobacco control. 
Joining me now is Bintu Kamara Bitieki, Regional Director of Africa Programs for the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. It's an advocacy organization that aims to reduce tobacco use and its deadly consequences in the United States and around the world. Mrs. Bitieki, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Lena. So what is your take on where we stand in the global fight against uh, uh, tobacco, particularly in Africa? Well, on the global level, um, tobacco use rates have declined thanks to many countries that have adopted and are implementing strong tobacco control policies. So that's on the global level. Unfortunately, our story in Africa is a little bit different. So um, tobacco, con tobacco companies have for a long time now set their eyes on the, the, African, company, the African continent. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's mainly for several reasons. One, we have more flexible practices um, on the continent and uh, fewer res restrictions that allow them to take advantage of and uh, market their um, lethal products yeah. uh, in Africa. Secondly, um, while the tobacco use rates have uh, remained in the single digits compared to the rest of the world, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, uh, those rates are bound to uh, increase. Okay. Um, and uh, let me talk uh, about the fact that your organization is focusing on children. Why is it important to focus on this population, children and kids, kids and youth in general? It's very important because kids is our future. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about protecting um, a population that's going to represent probably the future smokers of mm -hmm. tomorrow. So our use of today is the tobacco companies um, as uh, replacement smokers of tomorrow. So we need to educate them as much as possible so that we can prevent hopefully the nearly 8 million deaths uh, related to tobacco use that Dr. Prasad from the WHO was uh, just citing. So what is the priority when we talk about tobacco control, especially uh, talking about the youth? Uh, are we trying to pre prevent new smokers or help those who are already smoking, help them quit? Yeah. I think both populations are equally important. If um, a country implements the strong tobacco control policies that mm -hmm. uh, the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control uh, requires, uh, those policies will unequivocally not only cater and help with um, encouraging non-smokers to not pick up the habit and uh, current smokers to quit. Perfect example of doing that uh, is by uh, putting graphic health warning, a uh, large graphic health warning on tobacco products because the jarring images yes. can uh, deteriorate the uh, envy or just uh, tell uh, users and non-users to either not start or, okay. or to quit. Mrs. Bitieki, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And Bintu Kamara Bitieki is the director of Africa programs for the campaign for tobacco free kids. And that's our health report for today. To stay in touch, find me on Twitter at Lenore Mudu. Esther, back to you. Thank you so much, Lenore. And that's our show for today. Good night from Washington.